Environmental Quality Board. Blaze Hollett from the board wasn't able to be here this evening, but he has brought us some pollinator seeds for everybody to take home tonight. They do have a pollinator challenge within Peters Township that I'm going to send out on an email if anybody would like to check it out. Um, next, I'm going to hand it over to Linda from the Peters Township Public Library Foundation, who's going to say a few words. Hi, everyone. Can I ask how many people are here live in Peters Township? Okay, great. You probably received our mailer. They told you about what we have done in the past year and what we do um, all the time for the library. So we raise funds for the library to help some of the programming such as this. We pay for the enhanced Zoom. Um, we have a used book sale. We The new um, counter in the front lobby when you come in, that's something that we were able to provide. So we provide a lot of the programming and um, other things for the library that are extra than just the operating cost. And by to be able to do that, we need help from you all. So if you did receive the mailer and would like to donate to us, we would really appreciate that so we can continue this fabulous um, health programming like this. Um, we do have an online donation button, so you can um, go to that and click on that, and that's right on the library website. Uh, there are 12 of us in the board, and uh, if you ever want to contact um, Sydney or anyone at the library and find out more about the Library Foundation Board, we would love to talk to you about volunteering or maybe being a part of the board in the future. But again, my name is Linda Lavenga, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you. And now for the main event. Uh, tonight we have Dr. Mark Miller, um, he's Education Director at the Pittsburgh Botanic Gardens, and Blaze, again, from the EQD, reached out to Mark about doing this evening's program, and we are thrilled to have him here. Thank, Thank you. you, Mark. Thank you. Um, how's, how's the mic situation? I think as good as we're going to get it. It is what it is. All right. I'll speak loudly. If you feel like I'm yelling at you, then I'll quiet down a little bit. Okay. Um, good evening. Thanks for coming. My name is Mark Miller. I am the Education Director at Pittsburgh Botanic Garden. How many people have been to Pittsburgh Botanic Garden? Not very many. Okay. <laughs> it's not that far away. I drove straight from the garden here in about 25 minutes. Um, so, yes. This fits conservatory now. No. <laughs> we like them, but that's not who we are. <laughs> we we do collaborate with them, though. We play well with others. So. Um, all right, well, I would love to have you come visit the garden. It's, um, we're new, we're kind of young, it's seven years old, um, and our welcome center just opened last April, last year. So there's a lot to see. We have a great cafe with really good food um, and several new gardens that we've put in. So come see us sometime. Um, so, we're going to talk about sustaining backyard pollinator habitats. As was mentioned by um, Sydney, I was contacted by Blaze Hollett, and, and um, I met him. He's being nice, you know, he, he ended up getting COVID, okay? So he didn't want to spread his germs around. Um, I don't think he'd mind me telling you that. But um, he did meet me at Glen Elm Grove. Elm Grove, thank you. Elm Grove Park before I came over here. He showed me the pollinator garden there, which is terrific. Um, applause to everyone who was involved in getting that there. And um, he asked for advice, and I said, why don't you make the whole hillside a pollinator garden and just have some paths going through it? So maybe he'll do that. Maybe he won't, um, but what has been done is really quite good. So if you haven't been over there to see that, um, I highly recommend it. It's um, well planted, and personally, I think late summer to early fall would probably be the peak time to see a lot of things blooming in that garden. Um, 
So give that a visit. All right, tonight um, we're going to talk about sustaining backyard pollinator habitats. I personally don't like to wait until the end to ask questions because then I forget my question and it's not very tangential to what we're talking about. So feel free to ask a question. Uh, during the presentation, I will repeat it so that everybody can hear what the question was and we can discuss it. Sound good? All right, let's get started. So uh, I decided to take a journalistic approach with um, exploring backyard pollinators. And so we're going to look at why pollinators are important, who uh, might inhabit your backyard, what they're looking for, uh, when do I add pollinator attractants, where should I place essential elements, and how do I attract pollinators. So let's talk about the why. Why are pollinators important? Um, as you can read there, it's estimated that more than 1,300 types of plants are grown around the world for food, beverage, medicine, condiments, spices, and even fabric. And of those, about 75% rely on pollination. Um, more than one of every three bites of food we eat or beverages we drink are directly because of pollinators. Those are some, those are some very important to me. Um, <laughs> plant products that rely heavily on pollinators. So, you know, chocolate, tomatoes, yeah. Almonds, I, I don't drink milk, said the grandson of a dairy farmer. I just have a problem with dairy. So I drink a lot of almond milk, and um, almonds are 100% relying on pollinators. Um, so they are very important. Pollinators are vital to creating and maintaining the habitats and ecosystems that many animals rely on for food and shelter. So not just us, uh, not just a human-centric view, but uh, pollinators are vital to many other living creatures on planet Earth. Um, over half the uh, diet of fats and oils comes from crops pollinated by animals. Um, so, and I'm going to ask you questions. So, any idea what that is? Those are good guesses, but I, hmm? cherry is the closest. That's that is actually an almond, which is closely related to cherries. They're in the same genus, actually. They're all prunus. Peaches, Afri no, not apricots. Peaches, plums, cherries, and almonds are all very closely related, actually. How about in the middle? Okra. What a beautiful flower, right? Okra, hey, edibles don't have to be ugly. So remember that. And that, of course, on the end is almonds. Can you see I kind of have a thing about almonds? Yeah. So I'm not going to read all these off, don't worry. But I, I just want to give you an idea of the magnitude of the influence and effect of pollination. So here's a short list of crops we would lose without pollinators. There's a lot of really wonderful plants up there. Um, and I would miss a lot of them. Durian, maybe not. <laughs> but uh, most of them. Uh, yeah. And it goes on. <laughs> so you get my point. Um, very, very important. Let's see if there's any here that I want to talk about. I love elderberries. They are native, by the way. And host plants to several um, butterflies and moth species. I'm not supposed to eat cranberries. I recently had kidney stones. Oh, you don't want that. All right, so who might 
you see in your backyard. So insect-wise, um, you can see bees, wasps, ants, flies, and other flying insects, uh, and even some crawling type insects that don't fly. Butterflies and moths, those are the kind of the megafauna of, of pollinator world, you know, they're the really beautiful uh, insects that everybody likes to take photographs of. Let's do it for the butterflies, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but also birds, bats, humans, and others like mice, field mice, for example, can be a pollinator. Now, bats tend to be nocturnal pollinators, and they also tend to be mostly in the tropics. So we don't have a lot of bat pollination happening in the Pittsburgh area and western Pennsylvania. But we do have almost all of the others mentioned here. Um, and I want you to, if you can, have less of a abhorrence of wasps and flies, okay? Some wasps are horrible, like yellow jackets. I don't want them in my yard. I've been stung numerous times as a horticulturist. Um, and house flies are a real pain. I don't want them in my house. But there are hundreds of species, and there are many, many wasp species that are very beneficial, and you want them in your garden. And there are fly species that you want in your garden that are doing a lot of pollination. So any or all of these are um, major players in pollination in our backyards here in the eastern U.S. Um, can you see those? Lacewing, that's a really good one. Ladybug, mealybug destroyer, that's a good one. Um, yeah, praying mantis, I'll show you a few up close and personal. Um, many pollinating insects are considered beneficial, and they help you in the garden to battle garden pests, um, which is part a vital part of integrated pest management. Who here is familiar with integrated pest management? A few folks, yeah. Basically, I like to think of it as a pyramid. And what you're doing is you're using every tool in your toolbox to fight pests uh, in an organic or natural sort of way. So one might be simple removal. Uh, another might be plant interplanting um, a different plant that would repel insects. Another might be that you plant at a different time when the pest isn't really around. And you use all these others, releasing ladybugs, and until you get to the very end, and the very last choice is using a pesticide. It's not saying you don't ever use a pesticide. That's not the point of integrated pest management. But it's trying to reduce the use of chemicals by using many other methods to get there. All right? Excuse me. Yes. I don't have a problem with the ladybugs, even though they're Asian introductions, because frankly, they're not really the culprits that are eating leaves. They too are predators of aphids and other pests. So I don't mind them, I personally, yeah. You, there are a number of really sneaky insects that look like lady beetles and they're not, and they can do damage. So it might be a case of that happening, yeah. These are some good bugs. Um, praying mantis, those are so fun. 
They're so weird. They're like from another planet, you know? I just think they're great. Um, and kids love it when you talk about, and after the female and the male mate, the female eats the head off of the male. You know, they love that. They think it's so funny. Um, <laughs> and if you've ever seen them just coming out of an egg sac, they, they're like little tiny miniature adults. They look very similar. It's kind of cool. Here's some others. I mean, it's going after that aphid. Thank you. And there is a, an example of a, a beneficial wasp, right? So over here, what is that? What in the world is that? Any idea? It's a tomato hornworm. And what's all the white? Yes. That is a parasitic wasp laid her eggs on that tomato hornworm. They hatched and ate the guts out of it. Love that. And this is actually from my own garden. And I left that hornworm sitting there as a warning to any other hornworms. <laughs> Don't come in my garden or that's what's going to happen to you. I think that's so cool. Um, and lacewing, you can see how it got its name is the second one up on the right. Um, they are a wide-ranging predator of many pests, not just one or two. So it's really fascinating, uh, actually. So how do you attract good guys to your garden? Well, uh, you have to make sure that your garden has the plants and conditions that the good guys need to enter and remain in your garden. So I have some plants up here that attract good beneficials. So what's that? You might get it confused with that because they look very similar, don't they? This is fennel, and over there is dill, right? Um, so fennel and dill, they don't take up a lot of room in your garden. I, I like to just sort of broadcast a few seeds around, and wherever they come up, that's fine. Um, I have found that anything that's, that has an umbel, like an umbrella-like flower, tends to be attractive to beneficial insects. That one? Lobelia. Borage. But the lobelia was a good guess. Yeah, that's borage. This is garlic chives, allium tuberosum. I have a comment about that. And over there, of course, is a Shasta daisy. Um, these are all plants that are really good at drawing in beneficial insects to your garden. A caveat about allium tuberosum garlic chives. I really like it. It blooms in the fall, which is kind of cool because most things don't. Um, and you can use it in cooking. It has a mild garlicky flavor. But it'll spread like nobody's business. I planted three, and now I have 300 in my garden, right? So I call up Lisa, and she comes in, and she digs them all up, and she takes them to her Asian restaurant and uses them in her cooking. Yes? Where do you get borage? Um, yeah, where do you get borage? Well, I'm quite honestly, I, I admit that I'm not very familiar with your nurseries around this area, so I can't tell you specifically. But um, most, most reputable um, nurseries that offer herbs would offer borage. They would consider that an herb. Thanks. Yeah. So what are pollinators looking for in your backyard? Well, really, they're looking for the same things we're all looking for. Not necessarily love, but they're looking for food, water, shelter, and space, right? So isn't that cool? That's a hawk moth. That's so cool. Um, 
So you want to provide both nectar and host plants. Now, what do I mean by that? Nectar plants are those uh, plants that have flowers that have a good bit of nectar that is available to insects. So it's food. A host plant is a plant that um, a butterfly species, for example, will lay their eggs on. And sometimes they can be very, very particular about where they lay their eggs. So, for example, you've heard of monarchs and milkweed. Monarchs will only lay their eggs on Asclepius, which is milkweed. And many butterfly species are that particular. Um, the Dutchman's pipe, pipe vine swallowtail will only lay its eggs on Dutchman's pipe plant. So, um, providing both nectar and host plants is a good way to have pollinators in your backyard. Shallow water sites, um, even if it's just a couple of bird baths, very helpful. Nesting, sheltering, and resting areas, we'll talk about that a little more. And try to avoid or limit pesticide use. Um, I'm not going to say this in a holier-than-thou sort of tone, but I don't use chemicals in my garden. So what do I do about weeds? Well, a gallon of cheap vinegar, a cup and a half of Epsom salts, and a dash of dishwashing liquid. That's it. I'll say it again, a gallon of cheap vinegar, I go to the dollar store, um, a cup and a half of Epsom salts, and a dash of dishwashing liquid that's kind of viscous, sort of like Dawn, for example, that's a good one. And you spray it on whatever it is you're trying to kill. It, my dog could go over and lick it after I've sprayed it, and she is fine. You know, I can step all through it. It's not going to affect me. I kind of like the smell of vinegar anyway. So uh, it works. Now, is it as effective as Roundup? No. You might have to spray twice or three times. It's not going to translocate down to the root and kill the plant necessarily. But I've had pretty good success with it. So that's just one example of an alternative that you might try. At, um, name the park again. Elm Grove. Elm Grove, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Elm Grove. Um, they do have several of the bee hotels, as we call them. Um, a lot of our native bee species um, are rather solitary. So rather than a hive, they look for the exact circumference of hole in something wooden usually where they can nest. And so these bee hotels have a number of different tubes with different circumferences that are attractive to different species of native bees. Um, I think they're great. And they, they can look really kind of cool. So it can be um, something ornamental that you put in your garden. When do you add something to attract pollinators? Well, ideally, you have something for pollinators in every season, even winter. Not so much in winter, but um, ideally, the food, water, shelter, and space that they need is there in your garden all year long. Um, that's when shelter and nesting areas are important in winter, um, water, and nectar and host plants, more important in spring, summer. You catch where I'm going with that. I personally leave my perennials up over the winter, unless they look horrible. Um, and then I cut them around the first part of March. And what that does is it provides some seeds for birds who hang out in the winter, but it also provides some shelter for some of our pollinators. So, 
And, you know, it provides a little bit of winter interest. You cut everything down in the fall, and it looks like a cemetery out there, you know. It kind of bugs me. So this is my garden, and it was like end of November looking like that, which I thought was pretty great. Where should you place um, essential elements? Well, that's hard to say without me just saying everywhere, and I'm not going to say that. Um, you may not have a whole lot of space, and that's understandable. Um, but you too, even in a small space, can provide um, the essential elements for pollinators. Um, this one, you know, is a little more typical of a suburban kind of landscape where you have some space to do some different things. That was actually more of an urban space, and it was quite small. But the way they designed it, I thought, was not only beautiful, but provided all the things that pollinators need in a small space. So. Several spots around the garden where pollinators can access water is really good. Um, I have, what do I have? I have a bird bath out there, and then I've got, actually I have aquatic gardens that I put in large containers. Um, and I grow horsetail and variegated cattail, which is pretty cool. Um, and not only is it a place for pollinators to come get a drink, but I see the squirrel is there and the birds and they all come and get a drink from these little aquatic gardens. And it allows me the opportunity to grow some cool things that only grow in water. So people come in and go, oh, what is that? Well, oh, that's a blah, blah, you know. <laughs> uh, having a variety of shrubs and trees and having a variety of perennials that bloom in different parts of the year is not only good design, but it's providing, again, um, the essential things that pollinators need all year long. Gardeners can help conserve pollinators by planting, again, host nectar or attracting plants, providing nesting habitat, protecting pollinators from pesticides, and even trying their hand at urban beekeeping. By the way, we have bees at Pittsburgh Botanic Garden. Um, we have a local beekeeping association that comes in and takes care of our hives. Um, yeah. And we sell the honey in our gift shop. And the reason you want local honey is because it has local pollen and you are developing a resistance to that local pollen when you eat local honey. Yeah. So again, um, I know I'm saying this over and again in different ways, but how do you get pollinators in your backyard? You give them what they need to survive. Okay. I think this is kind of interesting. How do pollinators find flowers? Um, they use flowers. I, I don't want to anthropomorphize flowers. Well, they, you know, they move in the morning and they, no, no. They're, they're not humans. But um, over time, as they have evolved, they have a variety of strategies that attract pollinators. And these include petal color, scent, UV light patterns, and nectar guides. So for example, with this iris, this is like a giant flag that the flower is saying, hey, come over here, pollinate me. You know, it, it, those bees and other insects know exactly where to go to get that nectar. And then they spread the pollen around. Uh, they've even looked at other things such as polarized light patterns, petal texture, temperature, humidity, electrostatic charge, 
uh, all of these things are in play uh, for pollinators to find flowers. Do you know what each of these are? What's that? Are you sure? No. This is a trick question. No, that's Agastache, Anis hyssop. Love that plant. When that's in bloom, it's like the Manhattan of biodiversity all over it. It's like every kind of flying insect is all over that plant. Now, I happen to like Anis and licorice, but some people don't. It's a really great plant, and it's a native. This, of course, is a type of milkweed. And as I said, that's a, an, a bearded iris. So what's the first one again? Agastache, or anise hyssop. Oh, okay. Again, you could probably find that both at a nursery that sells um, just perennials or a nursery that offers herbs, because a lot of times it's considered an herb. I love it. It is just a really good plant. They've got some cultivars that have come out that are different colors, like apricot sunrise, you know, blah, blah. But I like the old-fashioned blue fortune. Blue is not an easy color to get into your garden sometimes. And so this is one plant that'll give it, give you that color. So you also want to choose plants that flower at different times of the year. Um, plant in clumps. My friends just shake their heads whenever I say, oh, that's very onesie and twosie. I'm not a onesie, twosie kind of guy. So mass planting. Don't do three, do 30, you know, I, that's just the way I am. And um, we do find in research that pollinators do prefer a larger grouping or clumping um, in drifts. You'll hear that from for landscape designers. They'll talk about drifts, right? I had a client once and she said, I want my, my flowers to nestle. Okay, okay, Dobra, I'll figure that out. <laughs> um, and provide a variety of flower colors and shapes to attract different pollinators. Everybody has their choices, right? So I found this very interesting. Bees are most attracted to blue, white, yellow, and purple. And they do not see red. Butterflies are drawn to orange, red, yellow, and purple, while flower flies mainly visit white and yellow flowers. And hummingbirds are particularly attracted to red flowers, and if they're a tubular red flower, you are going to get hummingbirds. Yep. The one in the middle, uh, do you know what that is? Mexican sunflower, Tithonia. Not technically a native to North America. They are native to Mexico. Terrific plant, and the monarchs are all over it in my garden. So I just like it. Now, it does require sun. I know a lot of us have rather shady gardens. We'll talk about that. Um, but I really do like it. On the bottom there, that, of course, is Monarda bee balm, which I love. Great plant. Um, at the top there, that's a type of aster. So when possible, choose native plants. Am I a purist? No, I am not. Don't tell me I can't have my seven sunflower tree in the back or my Coosa dogwood. I love them, and I'm not going to get rid of them. Um, I would say the foundation of my garden is about 70% native. But again, I'm not a purist. Um, but when you're talking about pollinators, it is important that you have a preponderance of native plants because 
they are the plants that co-evolved with those pollinators in your area. So it is important. Um, obviously, if you want monarchs, you, you need milkweed, Sclepius. And look at all those native Pennsylvania milkweeds. Um, and they come in different colors. They can be fragrant or not. Um, I like milkweed a lot myself. Um, I would say butterfly weed is probably the most common milkweed planted in gardens as an ornamental. Um, I think I have four different species in my garden. Um, I like them a lot. Okay, now I'm going to get a little, uh, <laughs> little blue. <laughs> um, so this is a non-native milkweed called hairy balls. That's what everybody I know calls it. So, you know, it allows me to be really irreverent and say to somebody, come in my backyard and see my hairy balls. I know, that's terrible, but uh, <laughs> um, they're really a lot of fun, and they literally are like that big. Um, so there are some fun things that you can try. Here are some key pollinator plants for Western PA. Um, with trees, maples, crab apples, lindens, and service berry. Um, of those, linden, there is a native linden tree, it's Tilia americana, we call it basswood, but it's a rather large tree and it's kind of hard to incorporate that into your landscape. You're much more likely to find a little leaf linden or a bee tree linden uh, at the nursery. That's okay. Again, as long as the majority of things in your yard are native, it's okay to have some that aren't. Bee tree linden, Tilia tomentosa, is so, uh, it's not only attractive to bees, but it's narcotic to bees. So you see them around at the bottom, <coughs> sort of doing that, seriously. And um, I made the mistake of walking my dog by there, and she got in there, and of course she got stung on her, on her paw. And, ooh, so I had to pick her up and take her home. Thank goodness she only weighs 12 pounds. Um, shrubs, nine bark, pussy willow, sumac, viburnum. Most of those are native. Perennials, um, aster. I say aster if you're going to be technical about it. The taxonomists have sort of subdivided them and made them into unpronounceable names like Symphiotricon. I'm sorry, it's an aster. Period. There's that anise hyssop again. Really good plant. Milkweed coneflower. Keep in mind, coneflower, I really like coneflower a lot. But don't count on it being in your yard for years and years and years. That's just not the way they work. Um, they might be with you for four or five years, and then maybe not. That's just the way they work. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They recede. They can recede, and that's another good reason to keep the seeds up over the winter. I take mine in March when I'm cutting everything down. I take them. And I beat them on the ground wherever I want a few more to start growing. And it seems to work. Yeah. Um, annuals, you might try Cosmos, Marigold, which is native to Mexico, Sunflower, and Zinnia. Those are just good plants to have in your garden anyway. And herbs, uh, basil, borage, catmint. Napata, uh, lavender, and oregano. 
and I'll just address the fact that lavender isn't so easy for us to grow around here with our clay soils. If you want good lavender, you have to give it perfect drainage in the winter. Otherwise, you'll lose it. So if you've got an area that's sunny and has really sharp drainage, that's a good place for lavender. Nine bark is um, the straight species is like this big. There are some cultivars that are smaller. Um, how do I describe nine bark? It's um, it's in the rose family. It has a pinkish, light pinkish, creamy flower in May. Um, there are cultivars that have colored leaves, like Diablo has a dark burgundy. Um, Tiny Wine is another one I like. Uh, it does better in sun to part sun. Yeah. Again, host plants are those plants where insects will lay their leg, lay their eggs. Excuse me. So here are some good host plants to have in your garden: milkweed, fennel, turtle head. That's a good one for an area that gets kind of wet occasionally. They, they like moisture. Spice bush, very common here in, in Western PA. Um, dogwood, come to Pittsburgh Botanic Garden and see the hundreds of native dogwoods that are just coming into beautiful bloom right now. Tulip tree, pawpaw, I'm a big pawpaw fan, and all the different kinds of asters. Here's some more violets, the cabbage family, willows, viburnums, ash. You gotta watch with ash because of emerald ash borer, unfortunately. Hops, hollyhocks, clovers, lupins, grasses, many species. A word about hops. Um, genetically, it is related to what? That's right. Um, Cannabinaceae is the family. There are two gen genera or genuses in there. One is cannabis and the other is hops. Humulus. I thought that was fascinating. <laughs> I told some of my students, hops are hardy. Marijuana is not. Let's think about that for a minute. <laughs> All right. Nectar plants, of course, are those plants on which pollinators feed. So again, milkweed, and if it's repeated, both host and nectar, that's, you know, double bang for your buck. So milkweed, black-eyed Susan, I have about a thousand of those in my garden. They love my garden. They spread like wildfire. Aster, bee balm, blazing star or liatris, Cardinal flower, which is the lower photo there, it has to have consistent moisture. But if you've got that and you have a heart sunny location, it's a wonderful plant to grow. Um, and you will get hummingbirds. Button bush, which I like a lot, again, it doesn't mind wet feet. So if you have a wet area, it'll tolerate some shade, but it likes at least uh, half day sun. Columbine, which I like a lot. Um, Joe Pieweed, again, that'll tolerate occasional flooding. Ironweed, which is cool. Uh, goldenrod, my garden's lousy with goldenrod. And lupins. Here's some more. Butterfly bush, cone flowers, echinacea, yarrow, Yarrow is a good one for dry soils. If you have a dry, sunny area, they do well there. Phlox, 
The flocks are all beautiful right now. Mints, put your mint in a pot. Otherwise, it'll take over your garden. Um, perennial geraniums, goat's beard. That one will tolerate wet and shade. I have it in my mom's very shady, woody part of her landscape. Um, onion family plants, sunflower. Every garden should have a sunflower. Tick seed or coreopsis. And there's that agastache again. And a hyssop. Here they just made it very pretty and ornamental and, and functional. Um, I've seen a number of gardeners take old bowling balls and using them instead of gazing balls because they don't blow over, they don't get broken, they come in kind of cool colors. So if you have a bad hip and you can't use your bowling ball anymore, you can put it in your garden. All right, so let's talk a bit about apiculture or beekeeping. Uh, it's the maintenance of honeybee colonies. Are honeybees native to North America? No. No, they are not. Do we like them? Yes. Yes, we do. So again, I'm not pounding you about this, but there are non-native species that we Americans absolutely love and for good reason. These are European honeybees. Um, what do we get from bees besides all the pollination that they do? Well, there are a number of products like beeswax, propolis, royal jelly. Um, yeah, I, I'm fascinated by bees. I don't keep them myself because I'm not home enough really to do that. But my daughter keeps bees, and she does so in Australia. My daughter lives in Australia. It's really interesting. <laughs> I actually went to a beekeeping conference in Melbourne, and it, it was just fascinating. <laughs> um, bees are considered the most important pollinator. Why? Because they are uniquely adapted to gather and transport pollen. Their hairy bodies pick up that pollen so easily, uh, and they move it around. They go to a lot of different kinds of plants, and so they just really are uniquely formed to be great pollinators. Um, You do have some good organizations in Western Pennsylvania that could provide more information about beekeeping if you're interested. So Berg Bees, uh, if you're in the city. Uh, Beaver Valley is very well respected. Um, and Pennsylvania State Beekeepers Association. I didn't find any for Washington County. I might be wrong. but believe that we do and the township Peters Township does not have any guidelines but as a rule of thumb they follow um, like the state guidelines for keeping uh, beehives so like they have to be a certain distance from buildings um, you can't put them you know next to your neighbor's shed kind of thing so there are some rules out there that I can send out in a follow-up email great thank you Cindy so Again, I won't read all these off because that would take a lot of time. But um, these are plants that attract bees, plain and simple. What's the first one I have up there? If you take nothing else away from this talk, you'll say, man, that guy really liked Agastache, man. Well, it's a great plant. Um, Linda, you had mentioned a still bee earlier. Um, basil is just such a great herb to have in your garden. I always plant it next to my tomatoes, and you can't tell me that it doesn't change the taste of those tomatoes. <laughs> I swear it does. But if nothing else, I let, yeah, of course we're using the leaves of basil in our cooking, but I let at least 
part of the plant go to flower because they are great at attracting pollinators. And that means they'll pollinate my tomatoes and I'll get a greater yield, right? Um, shout out to Bethany. Bethany is actually a cousin of lamb's ear. It doesn't have the fuzzy leaves of lamb's ear, but it has a really beautiful flower that lasts a very long time. Um, I have a cultivar called uh, Humulo in my garden, and I love it. It's a good plant. Um, let's see. Clematis or Clematis, if you're British. Um, yarrow is in there again. Yarrow is really a great plant. You might think about it. I can't say enough about heuchera. They've come out with every leaf color in the world for heuchera. Um, but use it with discretion because I think deer kind of like it. Yeah, everybody's saying, oh, deer. Fennel. Now, I like fennel. I don't have any qualms about suggesting it for your garden. Um, but if we lived in California, I wouldn't because it has escaped cultivation and is actually considered a weed around lots of California. Um, Penstemon is another really great plant. I have a cultivar called Husker Red with like burgundy leaves. I love that plant. Love it. Even when it's not in bloom, the, the leaves are pretty. The seed heads are really ornamental. It's a great plant. Um, the penstemon. Specifically, penstemon digitalis husker red. Yeah. Um, it's named that because it was developed in Nebraska, home of the corn huskers. And so they named it husker red. Um, lemon balm. Do keep in mind, it'll spread itself around, but it is a nice plant to have in your garden, and it does repel mosquitoes. It helps to repel mosquitoes. They don't like that smell. Um, let's see. All right. These are all good plants. I don't like Russian sage, and I'm not saying that because of what's happening in the world right now. I just don't like it. So plant what you like. If you love Russian sage, then put it in your garden. But I just don't like it. I don't like the smell. I, <laughs> um, but give me a sea holly, and I'm happy as a clam, you know. So, and that's, again, it's not for everybody. Um, an annual that recedes itself a bit is sweet alyssum, and I like it a lot. It smells great. It's easy to grow. It'll kind of grow around. It's low, and it'll kind of grow around your pathways. It's a nice facer plant to have near the front of the garden. Thyme, of course, you can use for cooking. So how can you help pollinators? There are a number of things that you can do even beyond um, planting some of the things that we talked about tonight. You can participate in the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge. Um, you can advertise your pollinator-friendly lawn. Get involved in prairie restoration projects. Um, I'm sure Blaze Hollett would love to have your help with the uh, pollinator garden they have at Elm Grove. Elm Grove Park. <laughs> I'm going to get that before the night's over, I swear. Um, try to become a little more adept at distinguishing between honeybees, solitary bees, wasps, and flies. It's kind of a fun game that you can play uh, with yourself uh, on identifying some of the things that are flying around your yard. Citizen science. I love citizen science. Um, I used to run a, a program at middle and high schools called the Fairchild Challenge. And one of the challenges we always did was citizen science. Um, you too 
can be sending data to experts and professors and adding to our knowledge about many things in the natural world through citizen science. I think it's great. I think Sydney might have something to say about that. Yeah, um, in the past we've done some stuff at the, um, here at the library, and if you're looking for something to help you identify insects or plants or anything like that, iNaturalist is a very good one where you can take a picture and it sends it out there to the community and scientists um, and other community members using the app and website can help verify. It'll pretty quickly, you know, identify a larger name for it, but then, you know, they're going to hone in on that very specific whatever species it is. So that's a great tool. Great. Bumblebee Watch, the Great Sunflower Project. I'm a big fan of sunflowers. They're cheerful. They're, they provide so much. And they don't have to be eight foot tall. I mean, there's one called Teddy Bear that's about this tall. They should be in every children's garden, in my opinion. <laughs> there's the North American Butterfly Association, Association for Butterflies. Sorry. Now, I had to put attracting pollinators to the garden in there because Denise Ellsworth is a friend of mine. <laughs> but it is a good book. It is a good book. It is. Um, Penn State Extension is a wealth of information. It really is. I mean, that's their purpose in being, is to take peer-reviewed research that's been verified and distribute it to everybody. Uh, I can't say enough about Extension. The Xerces Society, that's kind of fun to say. Pollinator Partnership, it's doing it again. Stop that. Uh, Penn State Extension, you can look into bees and pollinators. Um, and see, here we are being nice. We're playing nice with Phipps, so you can ask Dr. Phipps uh, about pollinator plants. It's a good source. Um, again, here are all of the beekeeper associations locally that you can go to. Ah, North American Pollinator Protection Campaign. So there are a lot of resources out there. We're lucky to live in this age where information is so readily available. Um, so take advantage of it. But I always recommend .gov or .edu kinds of websites tend to have the most verified information. All right. Questions? I'm burning up to ask, what are some shade tolerant plants that you would recommend? What are some shade tolerant plants that might also survive deer? <laughs> that might also survive deer and attract pollinators. Now oh, that's easy. Okay, let me think about that. Um, the first one that comes to mind is goat's beard, or um, goat's beard, Aruncus. Um, I'm pretty sure deer don't like it. Um, in terms of a small tree, pawpaw will do well in shade. What about lungwort? Lungwort, I don't know if that is a pollinator attractant. That's not flowers. Uh, yeah, I would say so. Yes. Yeah, lungwort, um, getting that all year round sort of thing, I would say hellebores. Lenten rose. Um, they bloom during Lent, which is very early, but it is a source of pollen early in the year. Um, what are some other things in the shade? Columbine? Yeah. Yes, yes. Columbine would be a good one. I particularly would recommend um, Aqualicia canadensis, our native columbine. It's yellow and red flowering. Yes, that's a good one. Some of the flocks, 
like Phlox subulata. Um, there are a number of Phlox species that will tolerate shade and draw pollinators. Now, I don't know if deer like them or not. That's like ringing the dinner bell for deer. Oh, yeah, they love eating that. Yeah. And forget about hosta. They'll, they'll just eat that right up. <laughs> That's a pretty good list. Uh, perhaps. It is. There are some um, violets. There are a number of violets that will tolerate shade, a draw, a draw pollinators. Again, I don't know about deer and violets. Can you give me a Latin name on that? What you call figwort, I probably call something else. I'm not sure what that is. I grow it from seed, so I don't have actual experience with it, except that there's many seedlings are currently still alive. Figwort, I want, it's not hepatica, is it? Okay, I don't know what that is. It says it's scrofularia? Scrofularia, oh, all right. Give it a try, yeah. I hope that's helpful. It is. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. One, one question as far as the bees. Where are we on a colony collapse disorder? They've done a lot of research on that, and they have determined that there are a number of variables um, that have caused um, colony collapse disorder. There's varroa mites. There are mites. Um, they do think that there's a, a factor is the use of pesticides more broadly around the country. Um, climate change, believe it or not. So all of those things together have contributed to colony collapse disorder. They're getting a handle on it. I have hope. OK. Yes, sir. Um, in regard to integrated pest management, yes. are there any um, easy defenses against squash vine borer? They always get my subpoena. Yeah. And they it, try planting later. But. Which was a smart move, but um, Actually, uh, a barrier is the best defense, a barrier of whatever kind. But keep in mind that squash are pollinated. And so if you have something on there that prevents the pollinators from getting in there, you're not going to get any fruit. Yeah, yeah. Unless you go in and do it yourself, right. which you can. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, what is your preferred deer repellent? What is my preferred deer repellent? All right, you have to ask. Uh, I'm sorry if I offend anybody, but there are three things that work for deer. A 12-foot fence, an aggressive outside dog, and a gun. <laughs> and nothing else will work for a long period of time. Oh yeah, you can go out. I had a friend that used to go out. He had very porous blocks around his garden. He'd go out and literally urinate on them. And here, they kept the deer out for a while, but then they figured it out. Another friend had, you know, CDs up there that would do this in the wind. And they figured it out after a while. The hair, I, you know, I, we've tried everything. So, 12-foot fence, aggressive outside dog, or a gun. And my personal feeling is that every homeless shelter that has a kitchen should have a bubbling pot of venison stew <laughs> because we cause this problem. When's the last time you saw a bobcat in your yard? You don't. We got rid of all their predators. It's our fault. 
And, and quite honestly, I'd like to see Canada Goose Pate on the side of that <laughs> medicine stew, but that's just me. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I, I can't give you a much better answer than that. It smells. Yeah. Yeah, I have friends that use coyote urine. And the thing is that you, you just, it's hard to maintain that. You have to go out. We get a big rainstorm. You got to go out and reapply, you know. Um, it's tough. It's a tough problem. It's a big challenge. We have that challenge in our garden. Yes? Um, so I have a, a big hill in the backyard that's pretty steep, so I can't really mow it. And I would like to make it a pollinator garden. Is there any way to like effectively do that? Because right now it's just populated with uh, just weeds that not necessarily beneficial, um, like no flowers. It's just like a nice green mess. So any suggestions on tackling this huge hill? I'm going to give you my card, and I'm going to tell you to come visit us at Pittsburgh Botanic Garden because we have a hillside pollinator garden. And you can see all the plants that we use. Um, you have to make sure that you are preventing erosion. And so we had a good component of native grasses that not only drew pollinators in, but held the soil on that hillside. So yeah, you come see me, and you can see our hillside pollinator garden. Fight plants with plants. Um, I, I love a really thickly planted or seeded garden. And they'll crowd out the things you don't want in many cases. Thatch. Yeah. If you're running into that problem, I'd say that you might think about plugs rather than seeds. You know, getting big plants at a nursery, that is cost prohibitive. But if you can get them in plug size, they're just as good, if not better. And you can buy more because they're a, a smaller price. Yeah, they're small. Yeah. That's it, you're doing the right things. You are doing the right things. You are. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Sure. That's all right. I do. Um, is there a particular height that you want the screening to be? Ideally, like, ideally, probably 50. Wow. Well, I'll be dead by the time I just get it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, because we're up on a hill, and so we're looking down, you know, at the neighbor's houses, so 
Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, I like eastern white pine, but it has a couple of problems, and one of them is that it is susceptible to wind damage. Another is that as it gets older, it loses all its lower limbs. It just naturally drops them. So if you're trying to screen all the way to the ground, you've lost that when it gets older. Um, so what would I do? Well, the reason I asked about the height of the screening is that you could put in our native uh, Juniperus virginiana, eastern red cedar. That's an evergreen, but they're only going to get 15, 20 foot at most. They're quick growing. They are a host plant for several species, and uh, I like them. What, can you say that again? What is that? Juniperus virginiana, which we wrongly call eastern red cedar. It's not a cedar, it's a juniper. But yeah, good plant. It is native, uh, tough, it'll take wind. Um, yeah. But they grow fast and it falls down. Well, yeah, they grow fast. You could try um, something that technically is not native to the eastern U.S., but is native to western U.S., and that's the giant western arbor vitae, Thuya plicata, Thuya, T-H-U-J-A, Thuya. Um, there is a cultivar called Green Giant. I love it. I love it. I have two of them at my own garden, and in 12 years, mine went from this to easily 20 foot tall. What's your uh, opinion on hemlocks? I love hemlocks, and, and it breaks my heart that they're having so many problems with woolly adelgid uh, insects, which are really affecting our hemlocks. If you want hemlocks, I, I wouldn't recommend them for a windy area. They just won't take in that. General, in general, in I hate to give in. It, it, I feel like I'm giving in to this insect. No. So I, I would say that if you want hemlocks, plant hemlocks, but be very cognizant that you're going to monitor them. And if you start seeing a problem, you need to address it. Yeah. Yeah. Western Arborvitae, Thuya plicata, green giant. Really great plant. And it will stay branched to the ground its whole life. And so will the um, eastern red cedar. Yeah. Yeah, the deer seem to be staying away from those eastern red cedars too. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, yep. All right, we're getting kind of late, so I think that'll be it. Thank you all Thank so you. much for coming. Thank you. Um, feel free to visit this table up front. Mr. Miller, or Dr. Miller, brought some information from the Pittsburgh Botanic Gardens, and then in this pink bucket are some um, native pollinator seeds that Blaze Hollett of the EQ from Cal U, and then there's a couple of books up there if anyone's looking for anything to read. Um, the library does close at 8 p.m., so if you are going to get any books, make it snappy and have a good night, guys. Thank you. Thank you.